Alright, before we begin, I've got one quick shop update, and that is improved lighting. As I realized in the last videos, with the only light in the room being the ceiling fixture behind me, it could be kind of hard to see what was on the workbench. So I picked up that LED work lamp, uh, made a bracket hanging on the wall, uh, put some diffusers on it so it won't blind the hell out of me, and yeah, this is a lot better. Uh, both for me while I'm working, and then also for filming. So yeah, I'm like three videos in, and practically YouTube Pro already. Today on the workbench, we have a Milwaukee bandsaw. This is the 6232-20 model, which is a corded tool with an 11 amp draw, a 5x5 cut capacity, and a variable speed motor. Uh, it's partially taken apart right now because it is also partially broken. I bought it on eBay recently, got it for super cheap, and go figure, I got exactly what I paid for. So, uh, I'm making this video to describe the issues I ran into, um, how I troubleshot them, and maybe poke at some other parts of the tool as long as I've got it open. Now, I'm not AVE by any stretch of the imagination, but I'll do my best. Now, it's pretty clear this tool has not seen an easy life. Just going by the uh, scuff marks on the body here, to the uh, overspray from paint, and to the way the uh, power cord is lopped off short. Now this is not a problem for me, because I intend to use it primarily as a benchtop tool instead of as a port -a band uh, I don't have room in here for a full-fledged bandsaw, so my thought is I can make a little stand for this, hold it vertically on the workbench, and then use it you know, that way for doing small, precise jobs. So this is not a problem, but the lack of motor control from the dial is. When I got the tool, it would run at up to about half of the max rate speed when I bear down all the way on the trigger. I think it's supposed to go from zero to 380 saw feet per minute, which is a good range for most of the size, uh, most materials and metals you're gonna cut with a saw this size. But uh, zero to 200 is a little bit lacking, right? And particularly if you're using this in a stand, you're gonna be more inclined to wanna clamp the uh, trigger all the way down and then control it with a dial rather than try to feather the uh, trigger while you have this in the stand and then you have a workpiece in your hands and bleh. So that's kind of a problem. And of course, being from eBay, uh, this is one of those no refund deals, right? So how did I figure out the tool was only running at half speed anyway? Well, with a laser tachometer. You can get these for super cheap uh, on eBay or Amazon and they are super handy. Uh, basically, they measure uh, periodic reflections of the beam back into a sensor in the device. So here we have a strip of whiteout, you know, our, uh, I guess, cover it, knock off whiteout, uh, here in the pulley, and that's contrasted against the dullish metallic background of the pulley itself. So while this is not very reflective, it's still much more reflective than this surface, allowing the device to pick up the difference. Uh, these kits do usually include some reflective tape, which obviously is going to be much better at uh, sending the light beam back into the sensor, but they also tend to fly off, you know, if you're spinning something at a high RPM. So I find myself using the whiteout um, much more often. Now, usually you use this um, on the side of something, like on a, a lathe chuck. You know, you'll put a piece of the tape or a white strip on the side of your, side of your lathe chuck, but it does work just as so well on the front surface here. So by getting the RPM that is running at, and then measuring the diameter, you can calculate the circumference, and then that gives you how many uh, feet per minute it's turning here, which is the same as the saw feet per minute through the whole tool. Simple. And of course, the only part that's actually broken is the little plastic knob. <laughs> so you can probably see right there in the video that uh, dark part in the middle is where it uh, used to key in to the potentiometer, and that's just sheared right off. And additionally, a little nub on top here is barely dang dangling on. And that used to hold it um, into this part of the housing here. So I'm guessing this thing was probably dropped and just happened to hit, you know, very unlucky on this part of the tool. Um, I think that because the potentiometer was actually stuck at the halfway point. Uh, that's why when you put all the way down the throttle, uh, it would only go up to half speed. So the small drill bit and then a dental pick, I was able to uh, pull out the remains of this nub here and then shove a little Allen key in the potentiometer, you know, kind of as a test and uh, see that sure enough, I could get the uh, speed to 
go through the full range if I cranked it all the way in one direction and then feathered it with a throttle. So with that, I guess it's, you know, not that bad of a situation. Uh, I do have the full speed range now. I just got to come up with an, a better way of controlling the position for this thro throttle while I have it in the workstand I'm going to build. Starting with the power cord, I think that uh, speaks for itself. <laughs> really though, uh, it does feel like a decent cord. Um, it is at least, you know, flexible. Um, I don't see any ratings on here for the gauge uh, voltage limit or temperature limit, but uh, it does at least feel like it was a quality cord uh, before it, you know, had a little mishap. I do like this retainer because it can slide off, meaning if I replace uh, the cable in the future, I can easily move this to the new one and still have it fit in the housing the way it used to do before. And swapping out this cable would not be bad either because of the use of the terminal blocks up here. Uh, I figured I use these instead of a solder connection because they actually fork off the uh, hot wire to both this switch and this one here. Uh, so while I'm not going to swap this out today because I haven't yet, you know, found it necessary, if in the future um, this one foot cord begins to annoy me, I will not hesitate to uh, go in my drunk drawer and pull out one of the many others I have and install that here instead. Looking at the tool body, we can see that it's uh, PA6, glass fiber reinforced 30% with uh, TPS overmolding, standard tool stuff, and uh, it looks pretty clean. I don't see anything obviously nasty with it, and it is in very good shape, again, given uh, how used this tool, tool is. The uh, overmolding hasn't peeled away at all, and on the flip side, it's not uh, you know degrading from oil or grease or anything like that, that, like that either. I did notice in here too, there were markings both for uh, 7 and 12, which I imagine is referring to July 2012. Now, I don't know if that's the uh, data manufacturer of the tool and die, or the date the tool and die popped out this part. But if anyone does know what the industry standard is for those um, date markings, I would be interested in you know learning that too, just because it would give me an indicator of how you know old this tool is. So looking at the switch, this is a Marquand brand. Not really familiar with them, but I don't know many of these industrial companies. So uh, I looked them up online. They make switches for things like power tools, so the story checks out. Uh, looking at the model number for the yeah, 1299, I saw this is actually a linear potentiometer switch. So it takes the uh, hot in here. This is a normally open connection. And the moment you begin to press the switch, this becomes fully closed. The neutral, on the other hand, is always closed. And on the flip side, we have three smaller terminals for the ends and the wiper on a potentiometer. So while this switch uh, itself does not do any, um, I guess, of the throttling, the potentiometer leads in the back let you determine how far this trigger has been depressed and then do switching later on with the brain box. As for the durability of the switch, it does feel a little bit crunchy by now, but, uh, you know, coming back to where the uh, hot wire here forks off, it comes with this little switch, which is for controlling an LED uh, right above the cutting area. So it's worth noting that uh, if you have this out and open on your workbench and plugged in for testing. Things beyond the switch here might be hot, okay? Because at least this terminal here on the switch will be hot. And if that LED is turned on, you're gonna have part of the board, these wires, and the LED that are all energized. So if you have it open, do be careful. Uh, do not short the board. Do not short yourself, right? <laughs> um, you know, these things are not meant to be operated while plugged in, so just, you know, be careful when poking around, basically. Now, I'm thinking that this black wire comes in here, goes to that H-bridge, and then that massive capacitor, and that's all just for generating DC for the LED, I think. I don't know. Um, I took my multimeter to the capacitor. I was getting a reading of, I think, 3.8 microfarads. Um, I'm not sure where that leaf stands on the side of electronics and things. It's been forever since I've done any of those sort of calculations. But just judging by the size of it, it seems like awful overkill for an LED. But you know, from looking around, trying to follow the uh, traces, I can't figure out what else it's doing. So I think this half of the board is just for lighting up the LED. Um, and then these wires here also 
feed in, let's see. So I'm trying to do this one handed because my tripod is miserable and not good for getting into tight places. And these ones are just labeled white and black. So I'm not so sure, you know, what white and black are supposed to do. They go into uh, the area where the motor's housed um, alongside the uh, two power lines for that. And we're not going to poke in there today because that required quite a bit more disassembly on this end. And this, uh, this dingus right here does not want to come undone. Uh, there's a uh, cap bolt holding it in place, and I'm pretty sure this red lock tied it in because it did not want to turn for the life of me. And I don't want to crack it either, so we're not going to go any further than you know what we've got taken apart already, but at least this gives you a taste of what's happening on this side of the board. So if anyone has any uh, idea on what's going on with this, I'll try to give you the best view I can. It's definitely an H bridge, right? Tell by the squiggles and the plus and minus and the very clear label of bridge. <laughs> and then back here are a couple capacitors. But I'm not so sure. Anyway, moving on. And going back to the switch and this potentiometer, these two are what seem to control the motor speed. So like I said, this guy uh, goes from zero to 42K. And this potentiometer goes between, I think it was 22 and 42K across a little bit more than a quarter turn. So looking at the uh, dial here, you can see there's a slot in it for the uh, tab on this uh, potenti potentiometer housing to engage on. So it lets you turn only about a quarter uh, and this potentiometer itself will uh, dead stop once you get that far. Additionally, the uh, knob here has seven little divots that engage on this tab to give you seven discrete uh, settings, one, two, three, four, and then the uh, half parts in between. So uh, I noticed running this tool and adjusting the potentiometer and feathering the trigger that when you have this turned, I guess, the other direction to the uh, low setting, the trigger will actually go from just on to basically low, and all the throw on the trigger will be the same low speed. Now, if you have it set to high instead, where the potentiometer is turned right now, uh, as you feather the trigger, it will slowly ramp up the speed through the full throw of the trigger. So that gives you a bit of an idea as to uh, what the uh, little IC is doing on the back here. Now that is an, what, Atmel Mega 88AP, which you can't read on the camera, but I read it off before. So just a little generic brain box. And that appears to be switching this BTA24 Triac. So this Triac is, I think, what, 25 amp rated from the data sheet I looked up, and appears to have a pretty good size heat sink. Uh, this heat sink's riveted to the board, uh, and then the Triac is bolted onto that with a little bit of thermal compound underneath. So. That should last plenty long, given that it is uh, more than what double the rating of what this tool is supposed to carry and has all that heat sinking attached. So looking at the wires that actually go to the motor, uh, following the hot here from the switch, you can see it comes into the board at a place conveniently labeled ACN. And there's a red wire that comes and butts into a black wire down to where the motor is. Coming back up out of that space, there is another black wire going to this bluish greenish one that appears to feed the triac, which is then switching to the white one. That comes back down to your switch and eventually to the neutral. So what's really happening here is uh, the IC is reading the potentiometers, both the trigger one and the dial one, and then switching this triac off and on to uh, reduce or increase the amount of energy, uh, you know, electricity reaching the motor. Uh, given that it is... Uh, receiving AC and that it has brushes, I'm going to assume this is a uh, brushed universal motor, right? <laughs> I'm not going to pull it open like I said before, but you know, given we've gotten this far, I can at least take a peek at the brushes. No harm in that. So this guy seems pretty good. There is uh, quite a bit of brass in there. This was firmly retained. It has a nice spring on it, uh, you know, copper wire feeding right into the uh, carbon brush. 
and all the wear on it seems to be pretty even and clean. No chipping or anything like that, so it seems like it's you know at least a nice quality uh, brush uh, rubbing a well-made commutator. Yeah. <laughs> so flipping the tool over one more time, being careful because all the uh, guts are hanging out. Got the dry pulley right here, and note it is on this side because you flipped it over. And then the idler here, which is on the uh, lever, moves it back and forth to help apply uh, tension to the uh, saw blade. There's a little brush here to keep the breeze off of the uh, drive pulley. And then a couple of bearings to help guide the saw blade, and a foot to help support the material you're cutting. Uh, now this does slide both in and out, but the latch to actuate it is on the back, and I can't quite reach that with one hand uh, while I'm doing the camera work. And apart from that, there's the label. Of course, you know, made in China, but what do you do? And I think that's all there is to it. What are my options now? Firstly, I could bitch and moan and try for the refund, but that really isn't my style. Um, it'd still be a pain in the ass, and I'd still be at the saw. So let's forget that one. Uh, as a more realistic near-term fix, I could just treat the uh, potentiometer here as a set it and forget it, leave it on high, and then the trigger here gives the full 0 to 380 saw feet per minute control. Right? So put, put this guy in a stand, have the tachometer at the ready to measure the saw feet per minute, same way I already have. And I guess to go faster, I'd put a zip tie around it and just tighten it up. And to go slower, I would cut off the zip tie and put a new one on. Kind of a hack job, but it's also kind of a hacksaw. So it works, right? Uh, to replace this dial with an OEM part, you actually gotta buy the whole board, and that's 40 bucks. Can I do that? Yeah, will I? Probably not. You know, it's an option. What's also an option is just replacing only the dial, right? Just the one actually broken part. Um, because construction here is not terribly complex, and I do have a 3D printer and know just enough CAD to wish I didn't. <laughs> so if the whole zip tie thing eventually, you know, gets to, you know, bug me too much, I can, uh, you know, pull this guy out of the drawer, get the calipers out, and maybe make it a replacement for it. And I guess as one final possibility, uh, this board here, right, already has the Atmel uh, Mega 88AP, so I could possibly swap this out with uh, you know, Arduino something, something, something Bluetooth, and then write an app for it, right? And control my bandsaw speed with an app. And who wouldn't want that? 